evil done by non-whites is not what Amnesty International is all about. It's not what Human Rights is all about, Human Rights Watch is all about. It's about, for them, young white people seeking expiation for the charge of being uh, belonging to a society that's racist. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we have a slight digression from our programs that have focused entirely on the war against Hamas and the surge of anti-Semitism since October 7th. Today, we're going to speak with two activists about a topic that is largely ignored in the media, but which also speaks to the hypocrisy of the so-called human rights activist world, the persistence of black slavery in Africa. But first, I want to remind you to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, click on the bell for notifications. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more top story analysis. There is a daily top story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find The Daily Show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, you can see us on Telegram. You can find the latest news, including Top Story and other JNS TV content there by subscribing. And now to today's program. For a brief moment in time 20 years ago, American liberals cared about human rights in Africa. A civil war in Sudan had led to a genocide of black Africans in the southern part of that country carried out by Muslims from its northern region. The slaughter was horrific, and in late 2003, when news of the massacres spread to the West, the issue was taken up by liberal activists. For the next year or two, concern about the genocide in Darfur became a fashionable cause in elite circles. Liberal Jewish groups, in particular, embraced it as a new civil rights issue and a way to channel their concerns about human rights in a manner that had little to do with more mainstream concern in the years immediately after the 9-11 attacks about a war on terrorism. In the course of a war that began in the 1980s, more than 2 million black Africans were killed and hundreds of thousands enslaved there. But after a year or two of making noise on the subject, a settlement in the war there occurred and concern about the people of South Sudan or anyone else who might be victimized by Islamist groups in Africa largely ended. Yet human rights catastrophes in Africa, especially in places where Muslim groups coexisted with non-Muslims and particular Christians, persisted. We heard a lot about this in 2014 when a kidnapping of hundreds of African schoolgirls by the Boko Haram Islamist terror group occurred and gained the notice of fashionable opinion. Celebrities like then First Lady Michelle Obama went on social media promoting a campaign to bring back our girls. But after a while, that concern too evaporated. Yet as some activists are now reminding us again, the problem of not just Muslim violence against black Africans but of the persistence of black slavery long after most people thought the slave trade had been eradicated is a crisis that few in the West choose to notice. In countries like Sudan and Mauritania, the enslavement of black people by Muslim Africans continues. This raises some important questions, not just about what is happening in Africa, but why such an outrageous abuse of human rights and a revival of the institution that most Americans and Europeans considered to be the original sin of the West should attract such little attention, at the same time that most of the world is focused on largely imaginary or false charges of human rights against Israel. The obvious answer is that in contemporary political culture, the dominance of woke ideology, critical race theory, and intersectional mindset, in which humanity is divided into two immutable groups, white oppressors and people of color who are victims, locked in conflict forever, and those in the latter category are always assumed to be always in the right, 
no matter how egregious their behavior. We've seen that plainly with the willingness to not just avoid condemnation of Hamas atrocities against Israeli Jews, because Palestinians are wrongly assumed to be inherently victims and the Israelis wrongly assumed to be white oppressors. But with respect to African slavery, these ideological blinders also cause those indoctrinated in these toxic ideas to consider crimes by Muslim Africans against non-Muslim black Africans to be either none of their concern or somehow defensible. Just as mistaken is the desire to shoehorn religious and ethnic conflicts in Africa into discussions about climate change, which, while a more fashionable issue, has nothing to do with the recurrence of slavery. To discuss this issue, we have with us today two people who are dedicated to raising awareness about this crisis. Charles Jacobs is a veteran human rights activist, leading groups such as the American Anti-Slavery Group, the David Project, and most recently, Americans for Peace and Tolerance. He is the co-editor of a recently published collection of essays titled Betrayal, the Failure of American Jewish Leadership. Ben Prosar is executive director of the American Anti-Slavery Group and a former research director for the Jewish Leadership Project. His articles have been featured in the Algeminer Front Page Magazine, the Jerusalem Post, JNS, and Tampa. Charles Jacobs and Ben Prosar, welcome to Tom's Story. Nice Thank to be you. here. Well, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us today. I'd like to start by asking you to detail for us what is happening in Africa with respect to black slavery, where is it still happening, and why? Well, uh, what is happening is that there are at least five countries in Africa where um, black Africans are being murdered, slaughtered, and enslaved uh, by, by Muslim forces. And... Um, you know, it's Sudan and uh, Mauritania and uh, Libya. Nigeria is the worst. Just this last Christmas, there were 200 people slaughtered uh, in a jihad raid in the Nigerian village in the Middle Belt. Um, why this is happening? Well, it's happened for centuries, actually. it's We know about the uh, enslavement of blacks in the Western world. We know all about uh, plantations and uh, the horrors that happened here, but uh, for reasons that we should explore, uh, the West is not quite interested in the history of uh, enslavement of blacks by non-Westerners. And so it continues to happen now, and it, um, it very much actually looks more like October 7th than, than people would imagine. Um, in fact, people were saying October 7th is like the Holocaust. Well, it's actually much more like uh, the slave raids that are happening in Nigeria today. Uh, the Holocaust was hidden. The Holocaust eventually was done in mechanical ways, wholesale, uh, unlike what happened to the Jews on October 7th, which was not hidden, which was filmed on GoPro cameras, and which was up close and personal with rapes and cuttings and torture and burnings, etc. And if you want to look for the proper analog to that, you're, you're, that would be what's happening in Nigeria today. Interesting. Um, I guess that leads us inevitably to ask, why don't we hear about this in the media? Uh, I mean, after the Boko Haram abductions in 2014, that caused a brief bout of celebrity concern, but nothing since then. Is there a reason why the media is so disinterested in this subject and, as we know, so interested in some other subject? Yes, and, and actually the parallel, you know, blacks and Jews have something in common. It's just that people don't think of it this way. And, and that is that uh, when I first found out uh, in the 90s that um, vast numbers of black people in Sudan were being murdered and enslaved, hundreds of thousands were being enslaved. I, f I found out on, you know, it was on page 42 of The Economist magazine. And I, I just, why did it happen in my watch? I was a liberal guy. How could this happen uh, on our watch? But also, how could it be on page 42? And that led me to understand the real nature of the human rights community, which we see today with UNRWA, but uh, they're also failing the black slaves. And the reason is that the human rights community and the media uh, are not interested in human rights. They're interested in exculpating themselves from white guilt. 
And that is, if you want to know what the human rights community and the media focus on, you don't look at the level of the horror. Uh, you don't look at the, uh, the, the vast extension of, uh, uh, of, of what's happening to people. You actually can determine it by who the perpetrator, the identity of the perpetrator. And, we, and I call this in my book, The Human Rights Complex. And so that is, if, if things are done by white people, I mean, my, my first idea was to create, rekindle the, um, the anti-apartheid movement because apartheid was terrible and the West cared about it, right? And I thought, well, if there's slavery in North Africa and apartheid in South Africa, then surely the same people would be as interested. And it turned out not to be true at all because evil done by non-whites is not what Amnesty International is all about. It's not what human rights is all about. Human Rights Watch is all about. It's about, for them, young white people seeking expiation for the charge of being uh, belonging to a society that's racist. And so, and so the black slaves are abandoned. Um, I guess before we delve a little deeper into that, um, Charles, you just gave us how you got interested in this subject. Ben, what led you to this, uh, to, to care about this? Well, to say it very briefly and very honestly, um, I went to college at Brandeis, and um, my actually my maternal grandfather knew Charles, um, and I met Charles at Brandeis at the screening of the film The Honor Diaries by, among other people's, Ayan Hirsi Ali, and that was 2014, and that was the year when infamously she was denied her honorary degree because Muslims threatened to riot. And um, I'd already seen a couple of Charles's films, and I met him at the screening. And then I left college, um, at which there had been uh, a number of Black Lives Matter demonstrations, and I already was uh, not convinced that um, this was really helpful to uh, the black community. And then I got an internship with Charles, and immediately... Uh, he told me that he had been involved when I was very little in freeing African slaves in Sudan. And I'd heard about this a little bit, but not very much. And so I start, immediately started reading the material. I started watching uh, old DVDs in our office, and I found our, a great archive of tapes, which I subsequently digitized, and I put it online and so on. And it is it was so emotionally disturbing to me uh, as it would to anybody but it as Charles just said it was so sickening that there were ideological reasons why human beings who probably in their own personal lives are just as compassionate as anybody else wouldn't be moved to care about this let alone to make it public and really cause any uh, political outcry about it and and over the years, we, we were working on a book, and I did a very large amount of research, and then we redid a website, and I did even more research uh, on that account. And we started to find that not only was there slavery in Sudan, and, and there still are, even after the war, the jihad ended in 2005, and now South Sudan, since 2011, has become the world's newest nation, and there are no, at least as far as we know, no at least major new slave raids, but um, there are still slaves in Sudan. We don't really know how many. Uh, we have one estimate from 2006, which says 35,000. We're not sure. It could be many more than that. But we also know that there are slaver there's slavery in at least um, four other countries in North Africa or, or North and Central Africa. We know that there's some slavery in Algeria. Uh, a lot of this has to do with uh, the migrant issue of, Af of sub-Saharan African migrants, many of whom are from Nigeria and Niger, um, for and they're migrating for reasons which about which we'll speak shortly, and they're trying to get to Europe, and so they go north, and um, they go to places like Algeria and Libya, and so in Algeria, um, there are reports, very few, unfortunately of local Arabs enslaving blacks. We do have stuff, including an article I remember from the New York Times, where blacks are, you know, they're looked down upon terribly because uh, they're not 
because they're not Arab, but also they don't know, don't speak Arabic very well, and and um, they're they're some of them try to become more Muslim than the Arabs, and the Arabs find that despicable. Uh, in Libya, there are a very large number of slaves, um, and some of this actually leaked into the mainstream media. You may remember that about um, just a little over six years ago, there was video released by CNN which showed two black men being sold in an auction for $400 a piece. And this was very, very graphic, and CNN, uh, in fact, a very anti-Israel reporter uh, for CNN did a whole segment on this, interestingly. So the mainstream media, very occasionally, enough to get this out, does something on it, but it's, it's this one-offness which is so offensive. Uh, also in Mauritania, which is which and Charles will talk about this in much greater detail later, probably there are a very large number of slaves, and this is um, you go back to South Africa. This is an apartheid system. What happened is the Arabs conquered Mauritania in the eighth century, and they came down south. The, the Arab conquest of Africa. I, I just let me backtrack just a very small amount. The Arab contract. The, there is a contrast. The conquest of Africa took place in the 640s. 637 is the great conquest of Jerusalem, and then they go into Egypt. It's about 640 or 642. I've heard differing years. And then they go south down the Nile, and the Arabs find this great treasure trove of African slaves who can do their work for them and work the gold mines and so on. And, um, and it is a, an untold massacre. There's one figure of which I'm aware, um, which says that 120 million Africans died from the slave trade between the 7th and the 19th centuries. Now, that's dubious in my opinion because that's a very rigid figure. It comes from the figure of 25 million slaves taken both east and west, and then David Livingston's uh, observation in the 19th century that between five and six slaves, excuse me, about one, about, you know, five or six out of 10 slaves died um, during the course of being transferred on foot. So that gets you 120 million over the course of 1400 years. I very much doubt that because both societies are usually illiterate. And so, and I think that makes them much more disturbing that we'll never know how many people died. But back to Mauritania. So the Arabs invaded and they established themselves over the, the native peoples. And then you had a situation where many of them did not accept Islam for centuries. And there were the Africans, the black Africans, and then there were the Berbers. And the Arabs went to war with both of them. And then only in the 17th century, and I believe it was 1644, the Berbers finally relented and they agreed to Arabize and they struck an alliance and they, they switched sides. But the Africans uh, did not really switch sides. A bunch of them agreed to accept Islam, and, and, but none of them agreed to Arabize, and this is crucial. And so to this day, there is an apartheid system. Uh, in fact, probably significantly more reprehensible than South Africa, where you have a caste system of Arabs at the top, many of whom are quite light-skinned, and then you have... Uh, they're called Bede, the white men, and then you have the Aratin. These are people who used to be slaves, who are descended from slaves, but they accept their racial inferiority socially. And then below them, you have the slaves. And um, there used to be many, many hundreds of thousands of them. The, the documentation was very bad. Um, the U.S. State Department, for political reasons, because the the U.S. was allied to Mauritania for a little while. They fudged this. Um, we now think it could be fewer than that. Um, we spoke to a source last year who said that many slaves have been freed, even though uh, slavery has been banned five times since independence in 1960. Um, but never, the ban has never been enforced, and far more slave ab uh, abolitionists have been imprisoned than slave masters. But Global slavery index has about 149,000. That matches up with what our source says. Um, and then in uh, in Nigeria, um, we have a very, very 
disturbing situation, which is probably the closest to what was going on in Sudan in the 1980s and 90s and in the bit of this century, and which in Sudan very briefly was a jihad. There were two jihads, one between 1955 and 1972, and then another one between 1983 and 2005. And uh, these was a war between the Arab North and the Christian South. We don't know how many people were taken as slaves in the first war. In the second, it was probably 200,000 slaves. Um, two and a half million were killed. Um, and uh, these uh, raids on these African villages were really identical to October 7th in many of the, many of the ways, certainly the burning of the villages, the massacre of the gang rape. Um, and that's over in Sudan, but in Nigeria, that is in full force. Uh, several years ago, there have been, I believe Nina Shea at the Hudson Institute said that, um, or, or other people, it was other people too, said that um, Nigeria is at the beginnings of a true genocide of Christians. And Nigeria, it's popularly, you, when you go online, it says it's about 40% Christian. It's really about half and half. And in the Middle Belt area, which is roughly on the line of the Sahel, which separates the Islamic North from the Christian South, uh, you have massive numbers of uh, atrocities and attacks on villages, women raped, um, churches burned down, you know, pastors and clerics murdered. And um, and one thing you will get, it's not as common as in Sudan by any means, but you will get, um, particularly women and children, usually young girls, so sometimes young boys for use as child soldiers, dragged off as slaves. And we don't know how many. The State Department said a few years ago that it was, I think 2021, that it was, um, you know, perhaps, you know, more, at least 2,000. That's not very helpful, is it? Um, we don't know. And the most famous case is uh, actually the sixth anniversary, I think is February 19th, uh, a young lady called Leah Sharibu in uh, the town of Dapchi. And she was in her school. And Boko Haram showed up, and they dragged away um, uh, more than a hundred of her classmates, including her, and they killed a few. And a lot of other other of them, they were either Muslim or they agreed to convert. But she didn't convert, and so they kept her. And she's been a slave, a sex slave, for all these years. And it's reported that she has a couple of children. She's been married to one uh, the commander of Boko Haram. It was reported that maybe she had forcibly, you know, had finally converted under force. We don't know, but um, but that's basically the lay of the land of Africa. It is it is what you're seeing today, and what we're talking about is basically a 1400 year racist genocide. Well, this is all very shocking, um, and I guess it brings me back to the question I asked before. Um, you said that occasionally the media, you know, the mainstream media does something about it. Um, but is their disinterest mainly a matter of intersectionality and sort of woke mindsets in which basically, you know, is there anything a Muslim could do to non-whites that would interest the Western media or liberal activists? And I, I only reference it because about 20 years ago, um, liberal activists were very interested in what happened in what happened in Darfur, um, there was a movement largely driven. A lot of Jews were very interested in it and stopping Darfur genocide. But nothing about black slavery today, is there? Well, you know, let me just go back to the Darfur thing because that was kind of a hot. We had our our anti slavery movement going full force uh, about Sudan, and in fact, you know, we we helped this Christian group in Switzerland, Christian Solidarity International actually redeemed tens of thousands of slaves. Uh, we helped them raise money. They went there. They bought them back uh, from, from slave traders, and they went back to their villages. And this was like growing and growing and growing. And then the Darfur thing came up, and it was hijacked by kind of the left, uh, Ruth Messenger, if you remember her. The American uh, Jewish World Service, yes. Yes, yes. So she made it out to be, oh, this is farmers versus shepherds. 
Um, and the same thing is being said, by the way, in terms of uh, Nigeria, where uh, it, it's being claimed that it's not a religious, it's not a war of civilizations. It's uh, pastoralists versus versus farmers, and there's an inherent. You it's like know, a Western movie, you know, the, like Western, the, like the homesteaders Western. versus the ranchers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly right. That's exact. That's how they have covered it. And in fact, in Newsweek uh, a couple of weeks ago, the head of the Nigerian American community, Stephen Inada, had a piece in which he said, "Stop saying this. We're being jihaded, and they're putting this gloss over it so they don't have to look." Look, there's many reasons why the Western press didn't do it. And uh, one of them has to do with the black community. Uh, when we were uh, all in the news in the, in the early uh, 2000s, in, the, in, in 1995 through 2000, Farrakhan was very upset because, after all, if you think about his uh, major goal, which is to convince black Christians in America that Islam is the path to freedom, well, when you have reports coming out that Islam is not exactly the path to freedom with, for many black people, and when, as we had allies in the black press in New York, um, you know, with, with headlines in the Harlem newsstands, Arab slavers, uh, black slaves, Arab masters, black slaves, this caused a huge ruckus inside the American uh, Muslim community, especially with Farrakhan, who denied... Uh, some some reporter asked him at a, uh, a news conference, well, why are you denying that there's slavery in Sudan? And he challenged them, if you think there's slavery in Sudan, go find it and report. And the Baltimore Sun sent two reporters, and they went with Christian Solidarity International, and they indeed found slaves and wrote a five-part uh, um, story about it. Uh, Mr. Minister Farrakhan, you're wrong. So that, that's one reason, because it divides the black community, Muslim versus Christian. But I think the overall reason is what I, the things that I said before, that uh, the, the Western news following the Western human rights community is all about um, white sin, either, either uh, you know, on the good side, you know, helping white society to, to improve itself, or on the bad side, cursing uh, the sin and expiating and, and distinguishing themselves, virtue signaling themselves. I'm not a bad white guy, and that's why I'm, you know, and so now, you, you know, the Jews are white. So um, that's, where, that's where we come to that. Yeah, well, I think to me, you know, as a student of history and knowing that so much of this sort of ideological conflict we're in now is based on the idea that Western civilization is inherently racist. Um, America is irredeemably racist, and certainly, you know, racism and slavery is part of the history of the West. But one of the interesting aspects of sort of the general ignorance about history, and certainly in this country, and I, I think elsewhere too, is the complete lack of knowledge, even by people who claim to know a lot about the subject of slavery, about as as you referred to it earlier, Ben, about the slave trade to the E. East, in which millions of black Africans were sold by Muslims to countries in the Middle East. So is intersectionality also the reason why this isn't taught in the schools or even acknowledged exactly. by most scholars who are otherwise at pains to point out all the evils of colonialism by whites against blacks? Well, here's the, here's the interesting thing about intersectionality, which as you know, uh, and, and your viewers will know, that it's the theory that uh, there's two kinds of people in the world, oppressed and oppressors, and the oppressors are mostly white, and the oppressed are people of color and uh, gays and uh, women, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, therefore, in the United States, since the Arab Muslims here are a minority, they get classed uh, as one of the, as is on the team of the victims, right? Well, what's interesting even if you thought that that was an okay thing to, to conceive of, if you flip that overseas, it just it doesn't work. And according to intersectional principles themselves, since the blacks are minorities and are deeply oppressed by an Arab majority, you would think, if you were a strict intersectionality person, you would think that you'd be on the side of the blacks who are being oppressed by a, a Muslim Arab majority population, but it doesn't work that way. So, so, you know, I mean, I think blacks because, because the perpetrators are 
deemed people of color, even though that's a rather dubious concept, so nobody cares. Correct. The right the victims. Yes, that that that's right. I mean, you, in America, um, blacks are told by intersectionality that they must be on the side of Arab Muslims because they're both darker skinned people, which is not true, but that's but that's the concept, right? Um, there's a, a Nigerian American movement here that picketed Elon Omar's office. Uh, with pictures of Leah Sharabu, uh, free our hostage, free our hostage, saying to Elon, begging Elon uh, Omar to help them free black slaves from her brethren in the, in the Middle East, um, and and that black that Nigerian American movement is um, gearing up to to plead with America to understand what's happening to us. We are black victims of a terrible, terrible, uh, horrific onslaught, which includes mass murder, torture, and enslavement, and we need the human rights community to be on our side. And that will be interesting when that happens. Hmm. Um, before we go any deeper into sort of the African-American community and its relations with Jews and its relations to this issue, uh, let me ask again about like what people think of it is going on because when one of the explanations one gets to the extent that one gets any explanations about indifference uh, you know uh, breaks through the indifference about conflicts in Africa is that this is all about you know the fashionable cause of the moment which is to say climate change but is that true you know is it really about climate and not about religious and or ethnic conflict driven by Muslim ideas about jihad um, and why are people so quick to believe that, you know, it, it's it's this, you know, overall, the, the explanation for everything, climate change, as opposed to things that are rather easily seen right in front of our eyes? You know, as you, um, as you know, I'm I, I'm a student of history, too. And um, we're not here to talk about meteorology, but um, we do know Islamic history and throughout multiple periods of climatic upturns and downturns, um, Islamic history was going the same way, which is of expansion and massacre and subjugation, whether it was of Europeans or of Africans or of Christians in the Middle East or and, and Jews and certainly Hindus. One of the largest genocides in history, it appears, was that of Hindus. There was a, an academic whose name escapes me, in the 1970s who calculated that the population of India went down by about 80 million between about the years 1000 and 1525. Um, so, and uh, we know certainly um, people who studied ice cores and tree rings know that there have been multiple periods of global warming and cooling uh, during those periods and yet Islamic history did not really change its character. And um, so that's ridiculous. Now, you know, okay, you know, are there droughts? There are droughts, and that and that always causes issues with uh, regional stability. That's fine, but that's a political agenda, which is unique to the West and uh, what Western people think. Uh, very often is nice, and. Um, you know, and, and we shouldn't take that for granted. He, you know, I, I remember in the the, the, the wonderful um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy of John Le Carré, uh, the, the chief character George Smiley said about his um, his vile communist uh, enemy Kala in in Moscow Center in the in the Kremlin. Well, I'd, I'd much rather be. You know, I sound like a, a flabby Western liberal, but I'd much rather be my sort of fool than his. And the decent. Western liberal tradition, uh, you know, our ideas are, are much better than much of the world. But nevertheless, the problem is that we don't, is that they don't think like we do. So if there is a climatic issue, um, uh, history isn't going to move in a different direction. So this is applying um, Western ideas to this. But also, of course, there's, there's a great political uh, fad in the West for government to do very serious things about any kind of climatic issue, and that's far beyond the scope of this discussion. But I think, 
I think um, we just have to say this. And ordinary people, I think, cannot possibly be blamed for this because they're not, they don't mean any harm. But this, uh, on the part of the, uh, the so-called intellectuals who bring this, these ideas forward, um, and Charles will talk about this too, probably more, that, you know, there's, there's very often a strand of, um, of soft racism going on that people in other societies um, whose cultures and ideas genuinely are inferior to Western, uh, the Western um, Republican liberal tradition, uh, they're not really in control of their actions. They're, they don't have agency. They don't have their own ideas and they don't um, make their decisions uh, based upon what they believe. It's, they're always just reacting to something. This, they're, they're reacting to, to crop yields and so on. And, and some people react to crop yields, but that's not why. Um, that has nothing to do with the doctrine of jihad. That's, that's, written, in a, that's written in a book. Um, you know, talking more about jihad may, may also be beyond the scope of this conversation, but nevertheless, um, if I were... And I, and I, and if I were a Fulani Nigerian Muslim, I'd be very offended that people are saying that I'm massacring Christian women and children and uh, and priests simply because of a drought. That would be an offense to my religion, be offense to Muhammad, be an offense to the Quran uh, and and Sunnah, and um, and I'm sure a Western person could find their own equivalent of that. That is, uh, that's a good point. Now, one of the few heartening developments in the last month since October 7th um, when the Hamas atrocities against Israel has been the willingness of some Africans working against the Muslim slave trade and, and genocide to express solidarity with Israel. Um, both of you have uh, discussed this, uh, people like Simon Deng. And the question is, is this an isolated opinion or do people like Simon Deng, you know, are they better spokesmen for the people of Africa than the government of South Africa, which has been championing the blood libel of genocide against Israel at the International Court of Justice at The Hague. Well, Simon Deng was, uh, is a former slave. He's a Sudanese from the Shiluk tribe, and um, he was uh, taken away. His village was uh, October 7th. His village was October 7th. Uh, seventh. And he was taken away, and he was a slave for, for many years during his childhood. And, and he knows, by the way, that uh, in Sudan, it was the Israelis who secretly at the time, in the 1960s, uh, trained and armed the South Sudanese black Christian community to defend themselves against the onslaught of a, the self-declared jihad uh, uh, against them by the Arab uh, Muslim North. And so Simon is a very, very special person. Um, he wants to tell the world uh, that the Jews are the friends of the Africans. Um, and he insisted upon going to Israel uh, about a month ago to stand up with the Israelis. There is a South Sudanese community in Israel, and he rallied them. Uh, they marched from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, with the uh, Israeli flags uh, draped in the Israeli flags. They met, uh, I went with them. They went to meet uh, Sharansky. Uh, they met uh, hostage families, and the, the hostage families were very, very uh, taken with them because Simon said, I was a slave. I was a hostage. I know what you're going through. And um, so he, he's an amazing uh, person. The same is true. Um, for the people now in Nigeria. By the way, there's an important Nigerian-American community in America. It's uh, the diaspora here. It's very successful. Uh, these are businessmen, lawyers, doctors, administrators, and they're f trying to find a way uh, to, uh, to join with uh, the, the Jewish community uh, because they have the same enemy. The same people, Boko Haram is Hamas, but over there, you know, the same idea, they're ideological cousins. So the same thing that's happened to us Jews, it is happening to them. And if anybody just Googles Nigeria on a daily basis, you will see that just today, uh, 20 people were slaughtered in a village in the Middle Belt in Nigeria by Islamic radicals 
because they are Christians. So there's a possibility of an infidels alliance. Um, and I, I, it's, and, and besides for the, the fact, I mean, it just people should really care. Forget about the opportunism here. I mean, and, and, and any kind of practical uh, endeavors here. People really should care about black people who are murdered and enslaved. That's what America was uh, tore itself apart over the issue. And so they need to know. And so we are helping them publicize and, and get known. And uh, they'll, they'll, they're lobbying in Washington uh, this week uh, to, to see if they can get American congressmen to, to come to the aid and to get America to put Nigeria back on the countries of concern list, which for some reason it was taken off. Well, that's that's fascinating, but I think we both know that you know, sort of Nigerian, the Nigerian American community does not have a lot of you know political cachet in Washington. Um, so let's ask about two communities that tend to have much more, which is to say, the American Jewish community and the African American community in general. Um, how much interest among uh, is there among American Jews and you know their their mainstream organizations? About this issue, um, again, putting it in perspective that, you know, it wasn't that long ago uh, that a lot of American Jews were caring a lot about Darfur. Well, they were caring about Darfur because nobody told them that uh, it was it was Arabs against uh, it was Muslims against uh, non-Muslims or it was Arabs against blacks. The, um, the, the sad thing is uh, the American Jewish community is wedded to or at least the establishment leadership. Is is wedded to uh, to to a left wing view of things, and this is um, this is taboo. I mean, to go, I mean, this is Islamophobic, right? This is I mean, the same. You know, we could be talking, John, about uh, what Ayan Hirsi Ali talks about: the treatment of women under Islam, the treatment of Christians under Islam, the treatment of black slaves under Islam. These are all taboo subjects because the of uh, the uh, the victory of Islamophobia. In the, in, the, in the rhetorical uh, wars, which means that you're not allowed, that if you say anything critical of any behavior, conduct, history, practice, belief of the Islamic world, then you are racist in a way, which is ridiculous because it's not a race, right? It's a set of ideas. Um, so that has uh, rhetorically won the, the the battle in the in the war of information and so it blocks people from doing what they naturally would do which is to come to the aid of people who are victims of this thing and the Jewish community um, was active in our movement um, to free slaves in in Sudan as well as the black community the black community at the time this was now you know 20 years ago we had Eleanor Holmes Norton we had the NAACP uh, we had uh, we didn't get Jesse Jackson because Jesse Jackson said, "Oh, this is this is going to be anti-Arab, so I can't be part of this." Um, and obviously, we uh, angered Louis Farrakhan, who was we put it, it was put in a corner in a way. But um, there are black pastors now who are interested in this, and we're working with them. Dumasani Washington, who happens to also be a Zionist but a black pastor, is working to get. Um, Christians involved to to help uh, the victims of uh, slaughter and slavery in in Africa. Well, that that let me hone in then on about the African American community because we're not hearing much noise from them about you know black slavery in Africa today. Whereas we know that you know as the New York Times reported in a major feature uh, over this past weekend. There is a major movement of black pastors uh, seeking to pressure President Biden to turn against Israel and to force a ceasefire to allow Hamas to survive the current war. And the explanation as the Times, you know, in these interviews in the Times was that uh, these black people see themselves in the plight of the Palestinians, ignoring the fact that why would they would see themselves in the plight of people committing, you know, atrocities like October 7th. But they don't seem to see themselves in the victims of um, Muslim attacks on black Africans they don't, or enslaves. They don't know. 
They don't know. It's not reported in the press. And if it does, I mean, Al Sharpton said for a minute and a half he was upset by that uh, CNN uh, interview or uh, report that Ben mentioned about this uh, two black men who were who were auctioned off for four hundred dollars a piece in Libya. But that wanes, you know. And Michelle Obama, as you recall, did ha- hashtag Save Our Girl, Bring Back Our Girls, and that was for about a minute and a half until probably somebody told her this is not politically correct. This is going to be you're going to divide the black community, Muslim versus Christian, or you're going to anger uh, Louis Farrakhan. So this is a problem of the black community doesn't know, and the fault has to do with the media. And I also say the Jewish leadership. Jewish leadership knew all about this. I spoke with Abe Foxman about this years ago. They even carried, ADL carried a few of my, I wrote a piece in the New York Times breaking the story. The ADL carried it for a minute. But they don't want to, they didn't want to do this. They didn't want to do this. Uh, They wanted to hold. Because they see this as, as, you know, a hindrance to their alliances on other issues with That's correct. blacks or other liberals? That's correct. That's correct. Once the blacks, uh, uh, once you see the panoply of leftist causes, uh, and then you bring up the fact, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, your ally here uh, in the intersectional world is the same group that is enslaving you and murdering you over there. That's a big one. That That's big. And they didn't want to do it. Um, maybe they would do it now, um, but the, but the, but black people don't know that this is the case. They just don't know because the papers don't print it, because the papers are willfully blind to negative aspects of Islamic culture, history, and beliefs. Ben, is there any way to break through in order to get more people to care about this issue? Well, it's what we're working on. Though, what I would say just immediately. Um, spontaneously is um, well did I actually you know what I'll, I'll bring it back to what I said in the beginning um, and, I, and I'll I'll try to begin it with a, a story very very quickly because um, it's a longer story but I'll tell very quickly that when I was at Brandeis in 2014 um, as you can see behind me I love classical music I was in the chorus and there was a performance we did of excerpts from Handel's Messiah, which Black Lives Matter protested. And um, and they did it in a very underhanded and very disrespectful way. I didn't understand why they would do that because we hadn't, you know, we hadn't killed anybody. And um, and it was very hurtful to me because they didn't know who, they didn't know me. They didn't, they were calling me a racist without Knowing anything about me, and and so just because uh, Handel is a white dead white guy, uh, no, it's more just because they could get attention, and then, and but I think honestly, if it was, um, uh, I mean, of course I thought that Black Lives Matter, and I felt I mean, a you know it's it's like the Salem witch trials you accused of something you didn't do knowing you'd never be able to prove your innocence, but also I as I said before. This isn't helping the black community. There are a lot of very serious problems in the black community. And uh, those do get people sympathy very legitimately. And it's horrendous what goes on the, on the black community. And I cared about that very much. And and this isn't helping anybody. And, and I think um, a very good way to start talking about this is that black lives do matter. And, um, and these people in Africa, they're not uh, criminals. They didn't. They haven't spent their lives uh, killing and raping and robbing other black people. These are innocent people. And they've often been murdered and enslaved because they're Christians or they're the wrong kind of Muslims. They're, they're not Arabized and so on. And in fact, um, there was a, a, just a couple, just a, about a month and a half ago or so, there was a, um, I saw a rap video. It, it came out, it was, it was a rap video. And it's, it's, uh, and its chorus is Black Lives Matter. It's by a, a black Jewish rapper explaining that that slavery is happening and that, um, you know, the black uh, leadership establishment and the media, they don't care about this. And that people should care about this issue because Black Lives Matter. And I don't want to go through all the hair splitting with the phrase in the organization, but, but that is true. And um, it's only if black lives don't matter that, this that these 
atrocities are not an issue. So I think that's a way to broach it in, in a way which isn't, um, I think, has a minimum of, of political divisiveness to it. Mm. Um, yeah. Are there elements of this issue that we haven't really gotten into yet that you, that you want to raise? I just would say that this is another example, if not the best example, aside from UNRWA, of the failure of the human rights establishment, uh, which says it's about um, justice, it, and, it, and it says it's about human rights, but it's not. I mean, it's, it's politicized. And this is, I don't think there's any better proof of this than the fact. I mean, who would ever imagine that Amnesty International wouldn't care about blacks being enslaved? How, how, could that, how could you understand that unless you saw this in the way that uh, we've tried to explain it, that, that, it's, that it really is the human rights community is about punishing white society or correcting white society or cursing white society and uh, giving um, exculpation and expiation uh, to those white people who want to feel good about themselves, who can point out who can feel good about themselves by pointing out bad behavior that whites have done, and they have done. Uh, but, but talking about uh, Arabs having black slaves gets in the way of that. It impedes, it blocks the whole purpose and mission uh, of, of what drives the human rights community, and people need to understand that. And it's actually a sin, because what they're doing is they're abandoning the people who most need the power of Western human rights, and I've and this has angered me for twenty years. I mean, how can you? Allow, I was in Sudan. I helped free black slaves. What better thing could you do if you were a human rights person than to help free black slaves? And they won't do it. And they won't talk about it. And they won't think about it because it distracts from what they really want to do, which is all about themselves, which is to show how what a good white person I am and to scold white behavior. And this is like a, a childish, but also despicable thing to do. And I think that's the message. All right. Is there a way for our viewers and listeners to find out more about your work on this issue? They can go to uh, our website, iabolish, the letter iabolish.org, and they can pay attention because in the next few weeks, uh, we will be helping the Nigerian-American community get the news out that if you really think that Black Lives Matter, then you better help us protect us from jihad, murder, rape, and kidnapping. All right. Well, that's great. Well, Charles and Ben, thanks so much for coming on the show, and good luck with your efforts. It's a righteous cause, and we hope it succeeds. Um, and I do recommend that our um, listeners and viewers go to your website, find out more about it. We also want to thank our audience. Um, please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition. And whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms, or watching us live on Facebook or Twitter, or on the JNS YouTube channel, please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself. And we'll see you again next week.